And we're back, and we've got a special guest, Paul Brennan from Bring Our Birds Home. Hi, Paul. Hi, Jared. Nice. Thanks, thanks for thank, coming. Thanks for having me on the program. Great now, to some, be here. Some of you may recognise, uh, well, it's not his face. Uh, it's actually his hair that gets talked <laughs> about on, on Facebook and other mediums. Uh, Paul is uh, on a program on Face TV called Checkpoint occasionally, reading the news um, on John Campbell's show. So mm -hmm. there's a connection there. Yep, there is. But also, Paul, you're one of the few people that's come into this, our studio here and been able to recognise all three aircraft. Ah. The one behind you. Yeah. And the two on the I wall. I felt I was so being put to a bit of a test there, so I'm, no. I'm glad I came up. Uh, we've got some nice pictures here. I went to great expense getting the, the one behind you. It yeah, cost well, me a gazillion dollars. American Airlines <laughs> LC-188. Yeah, 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 it's yeah it's nice. So, yeah. And I just explained to you um, the old um, Pan Am fl uh, plane behind me was yeah, a, a photo taken by an old aunt of mine on a box brownie camera. That's so. a beautiful picture, that. Yeah. Um, a beautiful aircraft, a sad ending to that. Uh, Edward, um, Captain Music, of course, a famous uh, pioneer of the Pacific Airways for Pan American, and that aircraft is what did it for them. But unfortunately, uh, you know, he, a few years after that picture was taken, it came to an end in that aircraft. Well, we'll, we'll, but we'll ignore that. <laughs> <laughs> but such was the unreliable, that was the development of long distance flying. These yeah, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't put up with that reliability percentage these no. days. No, well it depends on what the fare was. <laughs> I mean if it was a good deal, you'd have to weigh it up, wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Now you're involved in a um, unique um, cause, I'd call it, mm -hmm. and what you're attempting to do is bring back to New Zealand some very historic aircraft that yep. flew for NAC and Air New Zealand. So Correct. Give yeah. us a a brief summary of what you're up to. Okay, so this um, came out of a little exercise between a few enthusiasts. I'm an enthusiast and I like to sort of track the movement of some of the aircraft that we've known in the past in this country, where they've ended up. And you sort of get used to these days seeing that they've been taken to the desert. Yep. Back in the day, all the DC-8s were taken to the desert and, um, and, and mainly broken up. And uh, you, you've got to move quick to save airframes. And the remarkable thing was that it, it turned out, as it turned out at the time, there was one example of the five types that we were looking that were originals left, and that was it. So obviously, once you find that out, you, you, yeah. you think, well, is anyone going to do anything? I mean, should should someone make a move? Should should are these first of all are these precious? Yes, they are. I I, I value them, and I've been saying in, in what we talk about that the sort of modern day equivalents of of the ancestral walker, you know. Essentially, those walkers that cross the ocean with people and taking cultures to other places, um, it's the same mission. It's just 700 years mm. separates them. So if they're precious and they have a significance, these must have. So once you understand that they're the final ones there and if you assign that level of importance to them, you either sit there and do nothing or you swing into action and you try and do something. And, and that's what I decided to do. I, I've sort of got a bit of media power and a bit of profile and got some people I know who are motivated to help as well. So we decided to do something. And, um, and of course, it's like going down the rabbit hole yeah. a bit. Uh, it all seems so straightforward yeah. at the start. But once you get into, and we've got five of them, understanding where they are, what the, how they've got there, who owns them, who is the guardians of them, everything becomes a sort of like a story in itself. So. Um, between the time we started and now, so many things have happened. We've lost a few along the way that turned out that uh, information was wrong. They've been scrapped before, not too long before we mm -hmm. came along, which is a blow because one of them was an NAC aircraft, the um, 737 NAD, second one delivered, which flew the first domestic jet service in New Zealand. Accidentally, a Viscount broke down. Mm -hmm. And they, were, bring it they, had, they brought it in. They, they had two in the country for training. Um, and uh, they decided to bring this and put it on for one flight. So that would have been great, but mm. unfortunately it, it had been scrapped. And I talked to the guy who scrapped it, and they scrapped it because people kept trying to break into it. So, <laughs> you oh. know, it, was, it wasn't even a good reason, so really. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, we decided uh, to uh, uh, have a go and to, to find out where they were, who owned them, and to, the mission is to get them back, and we're sort of getting there. You know, we're very close to one, and I think when we make that announcement, if we get there, it's going to please a lot of people because we're talking about the DC-8 there, yeah. because that really is a line in the sand for this country. Uh, if you'll know anyone who's mm. got any travel history knowledge will know that, you know, that, that basically ended 
the experience of going on a ship. It ended the isolation for New Zealand. Totally, okay. yeah, and, and on their own airline mm. too. So we could fly up to LA and around the Pacific mm. and, and, and it was a state-of-the-art machine. Uh, uh, you know, the DC-8 was a great performer. So, you know, that's part of our mm. cultural and social history as well as our transportation history. The DC-8 interests me and I said, um, when we've been talking before you came up, I said the DC-8 and uh, probably the DC-10 mm. are the two I'd like to just focus mm. on mm. Uh, today. Sure. One of the reasons the DC-8, I have fond memories of that going out in the old days when someone was travelling, the whole family, the yes. neighbours, just about everyone went to the airport. Mm. And the aunt that took that picture of the Pan Am aircraft mm. was going to Sydney. So I think about 20 of us went out to see her wow. go out. We're Big all, occasion. She was dressed up, yeah. we were all dressed up. And yeah. out at Mangere at the, oh, what is now the domestic, or part of the That's domestic right. terminal, yeah. Yeah. we're all there. And there's photos of us with hundreds of us. <laughs> yeah, I've seen lots of old publicity shots and memorabilia that people mm. have sent in. That's been another wonderful thing. It's mm. uncovered so many uh, pictures, just as you described. Mm. You know, with women with gloves. Like the, like oh, the picture behind yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. It was a real occasion. <laughs> it wasn't just, oh, here we go, on the bus again. It was, now I uh, see on, on some flights there's people shorts, jandals, and the bare feet up on the yeah, wall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and all the cabins were had the, the um, you know, the imprinted panels mm. and all custom made. And those DC-8 seats, uh, I've never seen anything like them. They're just out there. They had the little speakers mm. between them. Uh, you see them across all the airlines had DC-8s. It must have been a, a, a Douglas feature. Mm. But... In New Zealand had those. Of course, we had our own colours, though, all the upholstery mm. and our colours. So. But yeah, it was an occasion. And I agree with you. I think the DC, that's what we've found in, our, in the feedback. The DC-8 and the DC-10 is what really interests people. Mm. And I guess that makes sense, maybe in a generational terms, but mm. the DC-8... Our age. <laughs> well, <laughs> the DC-8, for, for the reasons that you gave and, and we just talked about, mm. but also the DC-10 has a very interesting position mm. and we could... You know, we could talk about oh, but there's, the, there's the elephant in the mm. room, one mm. of the Erebus thing, mm. um, and uh, and and that may have some significance if we can get this thing back. Mm. But also, again, it was a game changer, wasn't mm. it? It was wide bodied. Um, it, it started to build the tourism industry. Initially, we could yeah. bring the people in. It had, um, I think, better range than the DC8, so we go further. Mm. It went all the way to London. BA had yeah. that deal, so. Yeah. I, I go along with that. The, the, those are the two popular ones. And those are the, the ones that we're, Jared, we're going as hard as we can to get. Like, now, yeah. So let, let's look at those two. Mm -hmm. um, they are both not, not quite in the same area, but yeah. one's in Manaus yep. in Brazil, and the other one is currently in Havana, Cuba. So. The DC-8, when Air New Zealand um, um, got rid of the DC-8s, um, NZC was one of the last passenger aircraft that they let go. They kept, I think, NZD and converted it to a freighter, and that stayed through the 80s. And they went to Marana Park, and then they all got distributed out to different carriers. Some of them went, I think, to uh, Flying Tiger uh, Cargo Airline, or, or, or one of the airlines associated with it ended up being FedEx, but they never operated the, uh, the DC-8. Um, NZC uh, went to a whole lot, a bunch of different carriers, went to a Canadian carrier, flew for force at Peru, was converted to a freighter, went to Brazil, um, uh, I think uh, converted in the uh, mid-90s, and operated through until 2004 for a company that was a subsidiary of a, a larger company called Beta Cargo Airlines. They went under, they went belly up, owing a lot of money. You know, that's been part of the, the sort of delay in getting mm. to this because it's been caught up in a, in a bankruptcy that's mm. been festering away for a long time <laughs> and involves a huge, huge number of assets. Uh, I think 20 aircraft are involved, including mm. that one. So unpicking that's been a, an interesting thing. But uh, that's good because of my point before where these things are easily lost, if it hadn't got caught up in a place like Probably that, been lost, it would have been lost. Mm. It would have been lost. Um, it would have been um, uh, trashed and melted down ages ago. Mm. But thankfully, the, this cargo airline went belly up and mm. just left everything w where they were. And and this aircraft was Manaus, Brazil, which is a sort of crazy location. If mm. you look at the pictures, mm. it's in the middle of the jungle. I didn't know anything about the place mm. until I got involved in this. Um, it's pretty sad if you're rolling any of the pictures. It's a mm. bit of a sad state of repair. But well, I think one of your, one of the sponsors that has to come on board is Wet and Forget because it looks like yeah. it just needs a good... <laughs> well, that's a great idea. Yeah, it needs a, a, a blast down. Yeah. And, um, I've actually had uh, uh, one person go and actually have a look at it now and they say it's not too bad. Mm. I mean, it's sort of weathered it quite well. It's mouldy and mm. stuff like that. And it's probably full of all sorts of stuff. No one's looked inside it for a <laughs> while. Um, but um, uh, it, it, if we get it, we'll have to dismantle it, mm. obviously, ship it back. But uh, it should 
when it's reassembled mm. and, and brought back to display condition, I'm told it can look like the day it came off the production line. So you can imagine what that would have been. When looked. they, in those days, they were shiny. The, oh, yeah. The, uh, the underneath metal yeah, was, and everything. Yeah. Beautiful. Polished. Mirror, mirror. Mm. In fact, I, I think they used to have designated uh, maintenance guys mm. who actually just polished the metal. You know. We'll need a few volunteers for that. Yeah. That's why American <laughs> Airlines have gone to paint now. They yeah. had, it's, you know, it cost them too much. Yeah. Yeah. And the other aircraft that um, I think sort of next on your list mm. at the moment is the DC-10. The DC-10. Um, we are talking now with the uh, Cuban embassy. I've talked with the ambassador there. He's been back in um, Cuba the last few weeks on business. He's, um, um, he, he, you know, he was really understanding of, of what we wanted to do. And I emphasise there's more than just a, a couple of old dudes wanting yep. to get some old machinery. This is, and took him through the history. He, he was unaware of the Erebus situation, mm. you know, and stuff. So once he got that, he thought, okay, I, I see where you're coming from. I'll go back and when I'm there, I'll ask a few questions. So I've got a meeting with him next week. And really, um, it, it could go either way. It could either be very complicated mm. or the top guy... Raul mm. Castro, uh, Castro could just say, give it to them and, mm. and we'll get it. So um, don't quite know mm. how that's going to go. The mission with the DC-10 is because it's so big, dismantling it and transporting it is a bit of an issue. Mm. The airport is about 15, the shortest route from the airport to the port is 15 k's and you've got to go through town. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, the French take the A380 through villages, mm. uh, so, you know, it can be done. Um, it just depends on having the motivation and will mm. to do it. But, uh, but that aircraft is in remarkably good condition, uh, considering it's been sitting there for about as long as the DC-8. Mm. Again, and then another airline's gone belly up, left everything where it was, Air Lib, which was, I think, uh, out of AOM, which was a French mm -hmm. charter carrier back in the day. And, um, and now it's used as an um, instructional airframe for uh, Cubana mechanics and apprentices. So maybe we'll have to try and replace it mm. if, if they want to carry on with something like that. Um, there are ways of doing that. There are plenty of um, uh, airliners being retired mm. that could be flown there and we could do a swap. If, yep. you know. So, but uh, I'm sort of confident about that too. Uh, you can tell when you talk to people who can help you, uh, when they get it, there's like a new motivation mm. comes in. Yep. Oh, I, I see. All right, you know. This is a great thing for your yeah, country. We're on board. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll see what we can do. They, they're happy to help. Mm. You know. Now the other three aircraft currently, if you can just quickly tell us okay, where they are and what they're doing. Well, like the two one of them are still us. Yeah. Well, um, well, three of them are still flyable. Mm. Two are still in service. Mm. Um, we've got the Electra there. Um, one of them, of course, is 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 one of our Electras. The second one delivered T T B in '59, and uh, that I was amazed to hear. Because when we were looking, that was the only one actually still flying mm. when we started. I couldn't believe the oldest <laughs> one was still flying. They've just completely um, rebuilt it to be a uh, fire water bomber, fight fires. So uh, we've talked to Buffalo Airways in Canada who, who operate it, and uh, they had a series of ice It's pilots. looking pretty sharp in, in oh, this picture. It's incredible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've got some footage of it mm. too. Um, but um, uh, they, they think they'll have that for another eight years until Lockheed will not support the product mm. anymore, and they've given them a time frame of that. Um, they just don't make parts. They won't guarantee any of the, um, uh, the, you know, the, the life mm. promises on, on components, so they're going to have to stop. At that point, we can uh, get it. So that's sitting there. That flies. I think it flew last week. They had some fires in Canada a week or two mm. ago. It actually was involved in that. Um, we, uh, I mentioned the 737. That was a disappointment because NAD was lost, but... Just as soon as we um, discovered that wasn't there, another one popped up on the radar, which is truly the only one left now, and that is um, a, a New Zealand 73, not a mm -hmm. NAC, but 82 delivered NQC. For those who um, maybe paid attention, um, that was the one with the cargo door on, on the front. Uh, I call it New Zealand's hardest working airliner. Mm. It carried 2.8 million passengers and uh, 180,000 tonnes of freight in 30 years, mm. operating... I, I worked it all out, six and a half days a week um, for virtually every year of those 30 years. Flying Daytime and night. Six sectors a day mm. from uh, 6.30 in the morning to 8 at night and then up to two return trips to Auckland to Christchurch Courier. Mm. And I used to hear it in Wellington mm. flying over at night. I could tell, oh, it was the NQC because you could hear the roar <laughs> of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the Pratt and Whitney's, you know. So, um, so that's the, like the little engine that could. Mm. So it was disappointing not to have a... Uh, an original NAC 73, that would have been fantastic, and the one that flew the mm. first, but I mean, it wasn't there. Mm. But this one, 
also has a spot in the history. And New Zealand probably wouldn't be what it is today without the 737. Mm. It really did build the, yeah, the, the, the internal the, travel the of the country, like no other plane, mm. like it has everywhere. Um, uh, we were considering the 111, the BAC 111 back in the day. The British government mm. sent their trade people out there and really forced mm. the hand. And, um, of course, uh, there was a DC-9 flying at, at the time, but uh, they chose the 7-3. They chose wisely, mm. and uh, we operated for 48 years. So that's a great example to have. And then there's the 747, um, and uh, that's probably launched many an OE, that aircraft oh, nice. for New Zealanders. <laughs> uh, we thought we had the first one, NZV, which was uh, parked up at uh, Doma de Dovo Airport in Moscow. Um, and uh, we had pictures of it and all that sort of stuff. And uh, I went and saw the Russian embassy, and they gave me a contact for the receiver of Transero Airlines, which uh, wound it up. Now, people might hear that name again shortly, mm. because the two aircraft that Boeing built for them that's sitting in the desert now are going to become the new yes, Air Force I, Ones. Yes, I saw that yesterday. So anyway, I talked to um, the receiver of, uh, by phone um, mm. in Moscow of Transero. And in sort of broken English, he said, Mr. Brennan, I am so sorry to say it has been scrapped. And then he said, how do I know that? He says, I had it scrapped. <laughs> so, okay, we, we had it. So like that, they do in Russia, things just disappear overnight. Yeah, yeah. Well, things and people. Yeah, yeah, well, well that's right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that was unfortunate. Um, we didn't get that in time. Mm. That was in 2015. But then, as it turned out, the only remaining Air New Zealand 74 in the world now is uh, MBV, which is the last one that was delivered, to, uh, ordered and delivered to Air New Zealand in 98. And that's flying for a Spanish airline at the moment, Wamos Air owned by an American company, and um, it's probably got about another two or three years of life before it's prohibitively expensive to overhaul it. And we've got the, I should make the point, we've got the first right of refusal on those three aircraft. Uh, the 737s in Canada, it's parked up at the moment, but still flyable. We're trying to sell it, uh, but no one's buying. Mm. And uh, the 74 is uh, operating uh, in Spain, but, um, you know, it's easy enough to fly it back when it's done. And it's literally, at the end of the service, it's literally worthless. This mm. is the thing that the, the, they really have no value Can't now. Can't fix it no more. And, mm. and also the new aircraft are coming on so so quickly. Mm. And the efficiency gains with engine and uh, airframe performance is such that even if gas is cheap, it's mm. still not cheap enough to make no. it viable to, you know, if you're going to get 400 people in a 747 to make it pay, unless you've got huge passenger numbers, it ain't going to work. So it all works in our favour. Mm. Um, so, yeah, those are the other three. So, if, no, sorry, so when we get these uh, aircraft back... I'm definitely thinking when now. Yeah, yeah. When we get these aircraft back to New Zealand, what's your vision for them? I, Jared, I try not to think too far ahead. Um, it's all about saving them right now. Um, uh, one thing I've discovered uh, with Kiwis, when you talk about these sorts of projects and the scale of them, uh, I don't know whether Muldoon spooked us all mm. with Think Big or something <laughs> like that, but... The, the, the fact that it's big sort of worries people. Mm. They think, that's too big. Mm. But when I start breaking it down for them, they start to understand. But I think, uh, so I only think as far as saving them, because people can understand that. Yeah, well, of course, yeah, you mm. save it. But of course, what do you do with them? Uh, I, I think they can be incredible attractions. I'd like to see them as a group and not distributed. And I think that um, if we can get them into one place, and it, uh, it could be any, any part in the country where mm. there's a good port, reasonable space at the local airfield, enough to land an empty 747 uh, if it's got the pavement strength. Mm. You, need, you need about 4,800 feet to do that safely. They did it in, in Sydney or New South mm. Wales recently with the um, Qantas's first yep. 744. They landed at a little provincial airport. Um, so anywhere where there's a port, we can get the, the derelicts, as they call them mm. in, <laughs> and, um, and, the, and enough runway to land the thing is, is a goer. So it depends on what region is interested mm. in enhancing their attractions, I think, as to who, who will be interested. Mm. But um, having experience and knowing people um, who operate other aviation museums around the world, I think um, build it and they will come, definitely. And we're starting to get some sort of interest sort of bubbling away. Mm. I've had a few inquiries, you know, kicking the tyres, what do you intend to do with them? I'd like to see them in Auckland mm. because the population base is there. It's basically mm -hmm. an Auckland story. Yes. These aircraft were based in Auckland. Air New Zealand's Auckland. The tourism activity, it's the gateway, is Auckland. Um, there are places, uh, I mean, the airport uh, has become a huge retail and, uh, and, uh, and business centre, mm. as well as being an airport. I mean, that can only enhance this. And I think in the scale of expenditure and, and overhead for something like this, it's relatively modest for what it delivers and how long it delivers. 
Something like that could be there for 100 or more mm. years, earning every day. The other little bonus with Auckland is that all the politicians are now going to put a um, light rail line, so it's going to be easy to get Oh, well, there you go. Yeah, it's <laughs> going to be easy. Yeah, you either step off the plane, arrive and go have a look or get on the, on the train. If we're quick, we could make this an election issue. We just need one of the parties to say they're going to back it. And yeah. They'll all be in. Well, um, I, I would hope that, I would seriously hope, and I haven't really done it yet because, as I say, we're only thinking so far. The mission is now to, to get them, to save them. But after that, I would... You know, I would expect there to be some interest. If these people are on their game and they're really thinking about, you know, putting stuff in place to, to attractions and celebrating our history. See, here's the other thing. It's not just the machines. It's the people who are involved. Mm. I think we worked out across those four um, airframes, they've, they've transported nearly 10 million individual people. That's a lot of people. You're lining so them all up. There's a lot of people with memories of them. Exactly. And, and you know, you've got five planes that are all intersex yeah. right yeah. there. Not only that, it we discussed before, it, it, it uh, changed that distance issue. Um, we we were a modern country when we did this sort mm. of thing. We were standing up with the best of them. And I can tell you, I know um, in the NAC case, some of those early NAC 737 pilots, they were so good that Boeing hired them after they retired to be consultants. <laughs> in fact, the flying qualities of the 737 Classics is pretty well down to the uh, operations manager of NAC, Alan Kenning, the late Alan Kenning. He, he did a lot of the early control, mm. in-flight control consulting to harmonize the controls and all that back in the prototype mm. days. I never knew that until recently. So we've been involved. We're all learning. <laughs> we've been involved in, in, in these machines in more ways than one. Now, I think uh, hopefully Soon you'll be perhaps heading to Brazil to do some deals? Well, it could be any time. Mm. Uh, we've got, uh, in the latest video update on our Facebook page, uh, I, I mentioned, and, and, and that's the other thing, social media and crowdfunding makes this possible. possible. It couldn't mm. have been done before, and the following tells me that there's a lot of interest. Um, but um, uh, we've put a letter in front of the uh, management of Inferro, who owned the airport that, at Manaus, who ultimately have the say. Uh, it's turned out there have been two failed auctions and attended to get rid of these things before no one's even put in a bid <laughs> because there's no value, see? Uh, it's taking up valuable space. My intuition is that will be positively received and it'll be the price, but then I'll have to go because... Mm. Um, uh, and then we'll have to negotiate terms. Um, I'm just hoping they'll... I'm not watching it, just, just hand it over because yeah. it, it gets it. But, you know, someone's got to say, well, at least we got something for it. But... Um, if people have been watching the Facebook page, they'll know that recently the German government have purchased the Lufthansa 737 out of Brazil, derelict since the, um, the 90s, mid-90s, I think. Uh, if people want to look it up, Lufthansa 181 was hijacked to Mogadishu, Somalia in 78, I think. Pilot was killed. It's it a terrible thing. Well, they've bought that. And I know how much they've paid mm. for that. So we don't expect to pay anything more. So how can our viewers help? We've, um, I, I think we've got quite a few viewers. Yeah, okay. Well, I think that they Ready can, and waiting. And I think they can maybe look, follow the Facebook page because that's where it all comes together. That's where I put all the updates. And, and, and when I say where, there's a few of us, but mm. I'm, I'm the front person, obviously. Um, we, we, it's totally... What you know is almost yeah. exactly what we know yeah. in real time. So it's this sort of unfolding events that, mm. like, will, what's gonna, will they, won't they? <laughs> so um, if people go there, they'll be right up to date. And just, first of all... Be positive, because I think that helps in some sort of mm. um, whatever way. But then, you know, when we need the money, because we will need the money. Start giving. Give. <laughs> and and at the, the, the sums we're talking about are pretty modest. Mm. If you think about that beach that, that people bought, yep. we're way below that. There you are. There's a, it's a worthy cause. So you can go to Paul's Give a Little page, which we've put on the bottom of the screen here. Fantastic. And if you don't know how to do that, ask a young one. Uh, they'll be able to help. <laughs> All you need is your credit card. Well, now I'm impressing my kids now with my social media skills. Yeah, they can't believe it. Yeah, right yeah well, they know how to do it now. Yeah. Well, we wish you all the best of luck. And thank it's you. customary um, on Bon Voyage TV for all our guests to take home a bottle of Invivo wine. Oh, thank you wine. so much. I thought, I thought you'd give me the Concord. Uh... No, no, that's mine. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Take that and uh, share right. it with your uh, co conspirators. Yeah. And Tell you what, we'll hang on to this. And when we get this DCA, we'll pop this. Excellent. So all the best. Yeah. And Thank we you, will we will keep it. you updated with Paul's endeavours. He's promised to send back some footage and uh, keep us up to date. So as more happens, we'll let you know. All the best. Sweet. Thanks so much.